Here we are yet again. All right, you have clicked on the Hoplite channel and I am your host, Hop. You are here to see the video, Samurai Literature, Miyamoto Masashi, part one. We are coming towards the end now. This is the, the beginning of the end, as they say. We're finishing up the Samurai Literature series. And as I mentioned in the previous uh, series, on um, Shigesuke, I've saved the best for last, I believe. Uh, the great Miyamoto Musashi, um, probably the most famous swordsman in all of Japanese history. Uh, there, there is no way I could do this series without him. He, he's kind of like the Superman of the Justice League. Without, the, without Superman, the Justice League, well, they're, just, they're kind of a, just a bunch of wimps. Uh, Superman will always come in and save the day, no matter what. And Musashi, I think, will come in at the end here and uh, save the day for the Samurai Literature Series. Nothing against any of the other members, uh, Sunetomo, Shigesuke, Chizanshi, uh, Munenori, Soho, but uh, the culmination here uh, is ending with uh, Musashi for a good reason. And we're going to talk about his life right now for a brief bio in, in part one, and then we'll get to uh, his work, uh, his contribution to Samurai Literature, uh, the Book of the Five Rings. Yeah, so let's talk a little about uh, Musashi right now. Uh, Miyamoto Musashi, also known as Shinmen uh, Taketsu, also known as Miyamoto Benosuke, also known as Niten Doraku. Right. We just know him as Miyamoto Musashi. He was born in 1584 AD in the Harima province of Japan, and he died in 1645 in the Higo province of Japan. So uh, in this era, I mentioned that he um, was not quite as old as Yagyu Munonori, but you could say they were of the same generation. Uh, he was about maybe 10 to 15 years behind him. Um, but we, I, I would consider them the same generation when you talk about feudal Japan and the Tokugawa shogunate, uh, how its distinction from the pre-Edo to the post-Edo period, uh, Musashi and Munonori lived in the overlap. They, they came into their own as samurai beforehand, but they uh, still had renown and fame uh, after the Tokugawa victory in um, uh, Sekigahara. So yeah, uh, Miyamoto Musashi. He is the uh, kensei of Japan. He is the sword saint. So that's a pretty cool title, right? If you were going to be a warrior, a bushi in Japan, uh, you would think that uh, dying and later becoming the sword saint of Japan, you would say that you were, uh, you were uh, hot stuff. Yeah. So um, he, uh, he's famous in Japan uh, to this day. And uh, as we go through the series, we're going to find out why. But uh, in his uh, humble beginnings, his father, a man by the name of Munasai, he uh, his far father was a farmer. And we know that his father died in 1592. So uh, Miyamoto Musashi was uh, still pretty young at this, at this time. He was only about seven. So uh, we find that his father, after dying, left him to the care of his uncle, uh, Dorinbo. And if you remember um, the great movie, Braveheart, William Wallace, his father and his brother are killed uh, when the English raid his village. And uh, his uncle, Argyle, comes and uh, adopts him and raises him. Uh, and like Argyle in the movie, Dorinbo, we know, uh, taught uh, Musashi the sword. Now, there's some accounts that perhaps his father introduced him to the art of the sword, the katana. But we know that it was Dorinbo who uh, raised him uh, with proper education, learning to read and write, learning Buddhism, and also swordsmanship and Bushido. Uh, we also believe uh, that uh, in uh, addition to Dorinbo's uh, teachings to Musashi, he may have been trained at the Yoshioka Ryu School. And this is a very famous uh, school um, in Japan, uh, ancient, well not ancient, I would say probably around the early 1500s was when they, they came into um, their uh, official status as a swordsmanship school in uh, feudal Japan. But it's believed that uh, Musashi perhaps had tutelage there as well. But what do we know about him after he uh, grew uh, into a teenager? 
uh, taking his Bushido and his art uh, into um, adulthood. Well, people grew up fast in this day and age, and we saw that uh, Musashi fought his first sword duel at the age of 13, and he won. So you imagine a 13-year-old kid coming up to you with his katana, possibly, you know, as tall as he was, challenging you to a duel or and accepting a duel you had, you know, thrown down to him and him besting you. And these duels were mostly exhibition. Uh, oftentimes they were with um, a wooden sword, Bokken. And uh, it's not to say that you couldn't die in these duels because, you know, a wooden sword is still, you know, essentially a stick. And if someone... Uh, were to deal you uh, a hefty beating with it, you could die from it. Some people did. But there were also duels that were to the death and were lethal. And we'll find out later in the next uh, segments on Musashi, uh, his duels that were fought to the death and how he survived them. But we know that he fought his first duel at 13, and that's documented in his book, The Five Rings. And he also ha won his second duel at the age of 16. So here you had this kid who looked to be pretty adept with the art of the sword and was probably going places with it. And he thought the same. So we know that in uh, 1599, he decided to leave his village at the age of 16. And it's uh, told in his book that he left all of his earthly possessions except the clothes on his back and his katana to his sister and brother-in-law. And he set out on the road in uh, 1599 at the age of 16. And he became a ronin. And as I said in the, in the primer series, um, to be a ronin, a masterless samurai, was considered uh, a dishonorable road to walk um, in, in, the, in the respect that if you had an opportunity to be a member of a daimyo's clan, an uji, that was much more preferable to being a ronin who simply walked the streets of Japan, the highways and the byways, looking for work, or perhaps being a hired sword, a sell sword, a mercenary. But uh, this is the life that Musashi chose. His father was a farmer, so obviously he was considered lower class, so he could not officially be a samurai for not having been born into a samurai class, so he had no option but to be a ronin. Um, but it didn't matter to him, really. It, actually, it seems like the ronin life suited him because he chose this life as a ronin and went on the road to win fame in Japan as a duelist. And as I said in the Yagyu Mununori series, Mununori fought for the uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu uh, clan at the Battle of Sekigahara. And it's believed, possibly, that Musashi himself, despite only being 16 years old, could have been at the Battle of Sekigahara himself. Although he was most likely fighting for the side that was, um, I can't remember, it was uh, Hidetoshi? I'll look it up. But he was first loyal to the uh, Oda uh, Nobunaga clan. Uh, that's where his, his father and his uh, uncle um, had paid homage to uh, prior to him um, being born. So he was loyal to Oda uh, Nobunaga. And as I also mentioned, he tried to sell his services to the Tokugawa shogunate after the fact, um, wishing to become the head lead, uh, the, the lead instructor uh, at the head school for the Tokugawa shogunate in swordsmanship. But of course, uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu had agreed with Munonori's uh, father that Yagyu Munonori would be the lead instructor uh, to teach the sword to the Tokugawa family. So it wasn't meant to be. But in any event, uh, Musashi, yeah, uh, incredibly famous, the sword saint of Japan. Um, so much could be said about him. I mean, I could make this series, you know, five parts and probably still have information left out. But I'm going to try to do it in three. And uh, as again, as I mentioned again, this is samurai literature. So uh, let's get to literature, right? This <laughs> yakking. Uh, we'll read now from the Book of the Five Rings. And uh, I mentioned in my Stoicism series, if you want to go back and watch that, if, if you haven't yet, if your house is burning down, and you have to run inside, and you can only grab one book on Stoicism, you should grab the Meditations. If you have the opportunity to grab two books, one on Stoicism and one on Samurai Literature, you got to grab the Meditations, and you got to grab the Book of the Five Rings. You should grab all of them, of course, because they're just books. How heavy could they be? But if you only have two books to grab, and you've got two hands, Meditations, yeah, and the Five Rings, for sure. Uh, fantastic work. Um, 
written uh, towards the end of his life. I believe he started this in 1643. And I'll mention in the par a third part of the series how he came to write this book and uh, what prompted him to, to take the step to put his life's learnings into one work so that others could read from his experience. So anyway, without further ado, let's read from the uh, Five Rings. And they're broken down into uh, different chapters. We have earth, water, fire, wind, and emptiness. And he says that the five rings, earth, water, fire, wind, and emptiness, represent the different states of being as a warrior. Earth representing hardness for steel. Water representing fluidity like your motion. Fire as in activity, your spirit, your, your chi. Uh, wind being motion, how you would position yourself and move during times of battle. And emptiness which encompassed everything. And the emptiness chapter, I want to say, is only about three or four pages. So we'll read now from um, the earth chapter, as well as from uh, his introduction chapter. Okay, and we jump to the introduction. And this is a good one. He begins with the way of walking alone. And these are simply bullet points that Musashi wrote down for the bushi who would read after his passing. He said, Do not turn your back on the various ways of this world. Do not scheme for physical pleasure. Do not intend to rely on anything. Consider yourself lightly. Consider the world deeply. Do not ever think in inquisitive terms. Acquisitive terms. Do not regret things about your own personal life. Do not envy another's good or evil. Do not lament parting on any road whatsoever. Do not complain or feel bitterly about yourself or others. Have no heart for approaching the path of love. Do not have preferences. Do not harbor hopes for your own personal home. Do not have a liking for delicious food for yourself. Do not carry antiques handed down from generation to generation. Do not fast so that it affects you physically. While it's different with military equipment, do not be fond of material things. While on the way, do not begrudge death. Do not be intent on possessing valuables or a fief in old age. Respect the gods and Buddhas, but do not depend on them. Though you give up your life, do not give up your honor. Never depart from the way of the martial arts. All right. So you could say that the way of walking alone is the path of the Ronin. You are a masterless samurai. You have no Uji, you have no clan, you have no lord, you have no brother, brothers in arms, you no know, fellow samurai that you can reach out uh, for help. Uh, and the same token, you have no fellow samurai who you have to help. You are on your own. Uh, the world is your oyster. You will live and you will die by your own actions alone. And he leaves this list as a um, warning to samurai or bushi who would read it later. These are the things that you should not do. Okay, do not have preferences, do not harbor hopes for your own home, do not have a liking for delicious food, do not fast so that it affects you physically, do not become intent on possessing valuables or a fief in old age. Dispossess yourself of these desires, of these wants, of these vices, of these things that you harbor in your heart, your mind, that may hold you back from the way. Uh, material possessions. Uh, your own uh, internal feelings as to how things are, or how things need to be. Uh, walk this path because you are walking it alone and you can't take these things with you. Do not take grudges. Do not take inclinations. Do not take preferences. Uh, follow the way. Use the way as your path for life, but don't stray from it because you walk this path alone. And if you stray, no one is coming to put you back on the path of righteousness on the path of Bushido, on the path of these virtues. You, you are your own steward, your own master. Don't, don't disrespect the gods, but don't rely on them either because they, they're not going to come down from heaven and save you uh, if you stray. And your fellow man will, will be nowhere to be found either. Uh, this is the way of the warrior who walks as a ronin. And I think he opens his book of the five rings hoping that people read this knowing he walked this path and if they are ronins themselves this is what he had to do to survive okay let's move along this is now page 15. 
And we are in the book uh, for the chapter on earth. And this section is under naming the two sword style. Musashi wrote, We speak of two swords because warriors, both commanders and soldiers, wear two swords at their waists. From the very beginning, long ago, they were called Tachi and Katana. Now they are called Katana and Wakazashi. I call this the two sword style in order to express its principle. The spear, the halberd, and other weapons are peripheral but are among the implements of battle. In the way of this style, it is correct for even the beginner to hold a sword and short sword in either hand and train in the way. When you put your life on the line, you want all your weapons to be of use. Your real intent should not be to die with weapons uselessly worn at your waist. Moreover, when you hold a single weapon with both hands, it is difficult for the right and left hands to move freely. For this reason, I would have you learn to hold a sword with one hand. With a spear or halberd, there is no other way but with two hands. But the sword and short sword are both weapons to be held with one hand. The way of the sword is not in handling it with speed. I will cover this in the water chapter. The sword is handled in open spaces, and the short sword is handled in narrow spaces. This is the most fundamental way. In this style, you win with either the long or the short. Okay. This is interesting. This, this, he gives us an insight into his mind uh, as, a, as a ronin, as a, as a swordsman, very early on. And this was Musashi's way. Uh, this was not the way. Okay, so what he is saying here is that the uh, katana and the, the wakazashi, which are the short and the long sword that a samurai carries in the battle, the long sword is his primary weapon, right? If you want a modern equivalence, you can look at a soldier going into battle with his rifle, okay? And his rifle is his katana. That is his medium range weapon. If you want to say his wakazashi, short range weapon, you would say that would be his sidearm, his pistol. So with his rifle and his pistol, he has both long and short sword. Musashi would be of the mind that, well, why do you, why do you have two hands but only fill your hands with one weapon? If you can wield both weapons at the same time, this is a better way. And this was unorthodox. Uh, the Japanese sword is built like a very long, gradual curve. Okay, it's not built like a rapier or a Roman gladius that is built for stabbing, that is built for short-handed strokes uh, dealt in close quarter combat. The Roman gladius actually is a perfect sword design for that and it was very effective. But the Japanese katana is built as a slashing weapon to slice, to cut. That is why it is long and it slopes and it comes to this tanto blade point end and is smooth, unsharpened on the top. It is for one-way cutting. Musashi felt that you limited yourself by dedicating both hands to this katana, right? Which was the orthodox style. And it was the way in which the katana was actually designed. It was designed to be held with both hands so that a samurai could always use both hands to make those broad strokes, those big slashes and cuts at a person to cut them down. Musashi didn't subscribe to this. He felt as though that he had more range of motion, more fluidity, uh, more um, effective combat on the battlefield if he were to uh, afford himself the katana and the, uh, I always forget this word, the wakazashi, the short sword and the long sword. And this was his style. And I'll, uh, I will use his picture uh, that demonstrates this style where he would come out with both his short sword and his katana uh, in battle, and that was his style. And this was called opening eyes to two heavens. Uh, and there's a famous uh, skirmish that he was involved in where he made this sword style famous, and I'll, I'll cover that in either section two or three. But he's telling his uh, reader that this is in keeping with the way. Do not die with your katana in your hand and your short sword, your wakazashi, in your waistband at your, at your waist. You should die as a true ronin, a true swordsman, with both hands filled with swords. Pretty cool. And as we see from uh, his, uh, his track record, he was pretty successful with this style. Just saying. All right.
Let us move to page 21. And this is under the heading, The Rhythm of Martial Arts. And Musashi wrote, There is a rhythm to everything, but particularly in the martial arts. If you do not train in its rhythm, it is difficult to succeed. To indicate some of the rhythms in the world, there are those for the way of no drama. When the rhythms of the musicians playing wind and stringed instruments are coordinated, the entire rhythm is balanced. In the military arts, there is a rhythm and timing in the release of the bow, in the firing a rifle, and even in mounting a horse. You cannot ignore rhythm in any of the arts and accomplishments. Moreover, there is rhythm in the formless. Concerning the position of a warrior, there is a rhythm to rising in the service of his Lord and a rhythm for retreating from it. There is a rhythm to being in harmony with others and a rhythm to not being in harmony with them. In the way of the merchant, there is a rhythm for becoming a wealthy man and a rhythm for ruining oneself with wealth. The rhythm is different according to each and every way. You should discriminate thoroughly between the rhythm of success and the rhythm of failure. In a battle of the martial arts, victory is in knowing the rhythms of your various opponents, in using a rhythm your opponent will be unable to grasp, and in developing a rhythm of emptiness rather than one of wisdom. All right. Yeah, it's pretty deep. Okay, he, he, gets, uh, he gets deep there on that one. So there is a rhythm in everything in life. There is a, a rhythm to winning and a rhythm to losing. There is a rhythm to being a merchant who makes money and a, a rhythm to a merchant who falls on hard times and loses his money. Uh, there is a rhythm in music, of course. And we can hear all the different instruments if you're listening to a symphony, this, this rhythm, and it begins with one or two instruments, right? Maybe the woodwinds or maybe the strings. And then the brass section comes in and then the percussion. And then this whole cacophony of sound becomes one orchestrated piece that is in harmony with itself, that is in rhythm. And this is what he says uh, to the bushi, to the samurai, to the ronin, perhaps reading this, you must understand that there is rhythm to everything in life. There is a rhythm to life. There is a rhythm to death. If you truly wish to be successful, you must learn the rhythm of success. And you must know when you see the rhythm of failure what that looks like as well. When you face your opponent, the rhythm of wisdom is great, but the, wisdom, uh, the rhythm of emptiness is better. And as we'll find later in the chapters, he mentions the rhythm of no rhythm. And this is the rhythm of unpredictability. That when your opponent is fast, you are slow. When you are fast, your opponent is slow. When, you're sh when you make short steps, your opponent makes long steps. If your opponent makes long steps at you, you make long steps. You become unpredictable, right? Maybe you mirror him for a couple minutes, but then maybe you do everything to counteract his movements in the next few minutes. And then maybe you mix it up in between there. But you never want to fall into a rhythm that he can predict because this is the rhythm of defeat. You become predictable. You become a, 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 almost a, a, a flip book of images that when you pull them uh, in fast succession, they become a sequence and you can see exactly where each new page is going to take you. You don't want to be that flip book in battle. You want to be the master of rhythm of no rhythm, of emptiness. A ronin who does not have any set rhythm, therefore his art can never be predicted. And you must learn that a rhythm for one battle may be the rhythm of success there, but in the next battle could be the rhythm of failure. Never be committed to one rhythm, but know there are all rhythms to everything in life, for success and failure, for life and death, for money and for poverty. Uh, for the harvest and for the, the, um, for the drought. There is a rhythm in nature, and that is, that is what happens uh, in terms of feast and famine. So learn these rhythms, understand that rhythm is everything in life, and you will become a better bushi, you will be a better swordsman. Because as Musashi said in the previous section, he adopted the style of the two heavens where he held two swords. This was very unorthodox for its day and age. 
he made it famous because he learned the rhythm of his sword, of his two swords, and was able to throw off his opponents no matter what weapon they held because he embraced this rhythm of success, which was the rhythm of emptiness. All right, last section. And for this uh, segment, this is on page 23. And he leaves some bullet points here for the Bushi to take heed of. And Musashi said, For those who would study my martial art, there are rules for putting it into practice. Number one, think without dishonesty. Forge yourself in the way. Touch upon all of the arts. Know the ways of all occupations. Know the advantages and disadvantages of everything. Develop a discerning eye in all matters. Understand what cannot be seen by the eye. Pay attention to even small things. Do not involve yourself with the impractical. Okay, so here's what he's saying about his particular uh, martial art and his, his take on Bushido, is that um, you must have a discerning eye for all things, and you must develop uh, and, and uh, take into account all occupations of life. And don't limit yourself to just being a sword saint. Uh, there's actually um, a passage in the beginning of this book uh, that William Scott Wilson translated uh, for Masashi. And there is a private collection in Japan of several paintings. And one of these paintings, I guess, was about four feet tall and about a foot and a half wide. And it's a simple picture of a branch with a, a bird of prey uh, perched on it. And the bird of prey is looking out into the, into the field, which is off the canvas. But it's a very simple painting. However, you can see the strokes of the person that was painting this image are very deliberate and there's nothing done without care. And the eyes of the shrike, the, the predator uh, bird on this perch are fixed and they are the focal point. Um, and it's beautiful. It's, it's one of those simple images that is beautiful for its simplicity and it makes no pre pretense about what it is and what it is not. It is simply showing you a bird of prey perched on his branch waiting for the next time to strike. And William Scott Wilson uh, indicates that this is actually a painting done by Miyamoto Musashi himself. So he did not forget the other arts and the other occupations uh, that existed in feudal Japan. And in fact, he obviously, in demonstrating in the, his uh, prowess in painting, uh, dabbled in these arts and occupations. Because as he said, and perhaps his most famous quote, think lightly of yourself, but deeply of the world. And that's a good, that's a good quote. You should always think lightly of yourself and deeply of the world. One, because the world was here a long time before you came around, and the world is going to be here a long time after you're gone. So think lightly of yourself and your position in the world because before you know it, it will all be over and you will be forgotten. Unless, well, unless you become the sword saint of Japan, then you'll be remembered. But to think lightly of yourself, you don't waste time in thinking that you are more important or special than you really are. Give yourself over to an art, to Bushido, if that's your calling. Or if you're in the merchant class, give yourself over to business and learning that art, that, that craft, that occupation. Or if you're in the priest class and you're, you're a Zen Buddhist monk. But don't ever neglect all of the other facets of life because if you take yourself too seriously in your own given occupation, you can neglect these things and you think too highly of yourself. If you think lightly of yourself, you will have your passion as a ronin, as a swordsman, but you will also be able to enjoy everything else there is in life because you will not take yourself so seriously as to disregard all other things that um, are enriching and, and make life you know, worth living. Yeah, right. Okay, so I'll leave it here um, with uh, Miyamoto Musashi part one. Uh, again, as I said, I could probably do at least five or six uh, parts to him, but I'm going to try to keep it within three. Uh, we'll pick up... Um, the next segment uh, with some more bio on Musashi. We'll talk about his career as a ronin, as a duelist and a swordsman. And we'll also move on to some more readings from the uh, Five Rings, which is, like I said, a really fantastic book. And if you enjoy samurai literature, 
um, it is an absolute must have. Okay, uh, once again, uh, this is uh, Hoplite on the Hoplite channel. I appreciate you being here. Um, give it a thumbs up if you like this series so far or if you just like Miyamoto Masashi and learning about him. Uh, you can like it just for that reason because he's that cool. Um, and uh, yeah, he, he really was that kind of a figure. Um, you know, I guess a contemporary, uh, a more modern Western figure would be like a Wild Bill Hickok. Like everybody knows Wild Bill Hickok when it comes to the American Wild West. When he drew his pistol out, you knew it was, you know, it was for real. And it was game on. When Musashi drew his sword and, and his short sword, you knew it was game on. And somebody was probably not going to make it out of there. Uh, that is kind of um, the fame and the name he had. So, yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to doing part two. I hope you are as well. Uh, so give it a thumbs up and a subscription if you're liking everything here. And we will see you next time. Uh, share this with family and friends if you think uh, they would find it uh, interesting or worthwhile to learn about. And uh, we'll see you next time around. Till then, take care.